Welcome to New Home Baptist Church. We want to wish you a very happy Easter. Uh, when I was a kid, I didn't know what Good Friday was about. I saw it on the calendar. All I knew is that I didn't have to go to school. And that was good enough for me. Good enough Friday. But now that I'm in the family of God, in the faith, I'm in the know, I guess. And it still seems kind of like an ironic name for the day, Good Friday, because it was a very dark day, and not just because darkness covered the earth for, for three hours, but the Creator entered into His creation and was rejected by it. Uh, they wanted Him dead, and He died. But our lesson is called From Despair to Joy, and that's why we call it Good Friday, because we can have joy because of the work that he did for us. And this lesson, we're going to take a look at the resurrection in the book of John, John chapter 20, and the discovery of the empty tomb by Mary Magdalene. We'll have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word, for giving it to us, for giving your Holy Spirit to us that he may explain your word to us. Father, just thank you again for what you did for us on that Good Friday, and thank you for rising from the grave. We just thank you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Session in a sentence says this, Christ's crucifixion and resurrection is the anchor of salvation and the motivation to live with joy, hope, and purpose. Our lesson writer started out talking about uh, good news versus bad news. And uh, I can't remember, he may have said that most people want to hear the bad news first. I guess they like to end with the good news. And I understand that, end on a positive note. I'm kind of the opposite, though, because usually when I start telling someone the bad news, they start jumping to conclusions. And so I'm trying to calm them down. So if you give them the good news first, like, nobody died, but here's what happens, you know, then they can remain calm while you give them the bad news. But uh, Mary, dear Mary, she jumped to some conclusions on that first Easter morning. Okay, the first point, the despair over the crucified Christ. Now, before I read these uh, first few verses here, we'll bring us up to speed. Uh, the Sunday after Jesus was crucified, there was a group of women who were going to the tomb and uh, Mary arrived there first. She saw that the tomb was empty, and she left to get Peter and John. Now, uh, she apparently didn't see any angels at that time, and don't let that bother you. You don't see angels either unless they're revealed to you. But Peter and John come. They investigate the, inner, uh, the empty tomb, and they leave without a clear picture of what happened. And uh, Mary has remained. She's weeping. Verse 11 but Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white sitting, one, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say, and they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. So she didn't see any angels earlier, but she sees them now. Um, she's looking in the same spot. I was looking at some commentaries, and ironically, uh, Matthew Henry was talking about how when we lose something, we keep going back to the same places to look for it again and again. And I thought, well, that brother lived in the day before car keys and phones and stuff like that, but I guess... I guess he still had that same issue that we still go back and we look. It's like, why is it not there? It's not so much where is it. It's like, why is it not there where it should be? But saw two angels sitting in white, one at the head and the other at the feet. Um, Dr. MacArthur said that this was to establish that this was a divine act. This was not something that men had done. This was something that God had done. And there's also an image here of the mercy seat, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, think about Exodus 25, verses 17 and 18. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold, 
Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold. Of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. So those two angels sitting there gave us a picture of that, and it gives us a, a profound clue as to the identity of Jesus. And they ask her, Woman, why weepest thou? Why, there's one of, reminded me of one of the Psalms, and I didn't actually make a note of where I got it from, but why art thou downcast, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. You know, she's obsessed with the body. Where's the body? But her hope should be in the God that, that sent the Son. She saith unto them, because they have taken away my Lord and know not where they've laid him. Uh, she doesn't seem to be making a distinction here between uh, the body and the spirit. I don't know if you've watched much Star Trek, but uh, the Klingons don't have a lot of regard for the body. It's just a shell, they say. Do whatever you want to with it. I mean, you can just throw it in the trash or out in the woods or uh, shoot it out into space, I guess. It doesn't mean anything to them. But in the Christian experience, we kind of have a certain respect for the body because it's going to rise again. God's going to raise that body from the dead. And... Um, Nothing wrong with cremation. That's not going to stop God from raising anybody from the dead. But I've always preferred uh, the more common way of doing it because uh, it's like that body is, is waiting, is waiting to awaken. So she was being pretty clingy here and jumping to conclusions. You know, the dead body was very important to her. Let's move on to the second point, the recognition of the risen Savior. Uh, we're in John 20 still, 14 through 16. And when she had thus said, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. So, she turns and she sees him standing. And we don't know if maybe she just didn't look real close at him or... Maybe there's too many tears in her eyes for her to recognize him. But, you know, we've got to remember those Emmaus Road disciples that Luke tells us about. Uh, they had him all the way in their house and didn't know who he was until he broke the bread. So it's very possible that she was just supernaturally kept from recognizing him. And he asked her the same question that the angels did. Why? Woman, why weepest thou? And uh, this is getting off track. I just can't help myself. Um, some people think that when the Lord called his mother Mary woman, that that was some sort of title, that she was the second Eve in the same sense that he was the second Adam. But you see him using the same word here to speak to Mary Magdalene. And while we're at it, there was also the Samaritan woman at the well who we know had an immoral life. So this is not a term of, uh, this is not a divine term, certainly, and it's not a disrespectful term. Yeah, you know, if I called somebody, hey, woman, you know, that probably wouldn't go over very well. But remember reading this in translation, there was nothing disrespectful about this. Whom seekest thou? She supposing him to be the gardener. Now, remember, the Lord's tomb was belonged to a guy named Joseph of Arimathea. So it was pretty reasonable to think that this might have been Joseph's gardener. And I guess if that had been the case, pretty reasonable to think that he may have some idea about where the body was. 
Jesus saith unto her, Mary. Think about John 10, 27. It says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. He called her name, and then she knew who he was. I pray that God will call your name, that he will call you to salvation, that you'll be listening, that you'll hear, and that you'll respond. She called him Rabboni, which is to say, Master. And you have to forgive me, I've for- forgotten what I've read already, but there were different forms of this word, Rabbi, Rabboni, but this was the most exalted form of it here. Let's move on to the third point. The mission given by the Son of God. Verses 17 and 18. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her touch me not he said and of course that's one of those things that there's a couple of different ways of looking at that but I've already mentioned that she was being very clingy that she was very concerned about where the body was Um, so I agree with I guess the consensus what most people think that he was saying that he was trying to express to her that things are going to be different now It's not like simply, I'm alive again, so everything goes back to the way that it was. No, things were going to be very different. He was going to ascend to his Father, which he did, and he sent the Holy Spirit to be with us, to be our comforter. We're moving into a different stage of uh, redemptive history, and she had to accept that. Now, there is also the thought that he may have been going to present his blood to his father and that as the high priest he could not be touched while he was on that way. Now, I'm not going to get too much into the pros and cons of that theory um, because we'd be, you know, we'd be sidetracked. We'd be here <laughs> longer than we needed to be. But so even though I don't agree with that interpretation, the reason I bring it up it's because it reminds me that he is our high priest. And uh, in our discipleship training class a couple of weeks ago, we had that thought that he was the high priest who came and presented the sacrifice. And he was also the sacrifice himself. Just such a profound reality. I don't know how you ever get over it. and Maybe we shouldn't. And uh, the last time we met here in the church, it was... He is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, the author and the finisher. Uh, He's everything. Uh, He completes it. He does the work. Uh, We must only place our faith in him. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples she had seen the Lord and had spoken these things unto her. Let's look at Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all the things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world." Amen. Yes, it would be good. I can understand uh, Mary want to cling to him, to hang on to him, to keep him around. But he left so that the Holy Spirit could come and be with us always and be in every believer and empower us to do ministry. Let's look at this fill in the blank that's on our last point. Christ's exaltation. Christ was exalted when God raised him from the dead. And Christ was exalted when he ascended to the Father's right hand. He will be exalted 
by all creation when he returns. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You're going to do it one way or another. I'd rather you do it willingly. I'd rather you do it now. Um, we're still running scared from this virus and from <laughs> everything that's going on in the world. Uh, but we don't have to. We can have confidence that Jesus has overcome the world. He's going to come back. He's going to set it straight. He's going to take us to that place that he's at now that he's preparing for us. And that's my prayer for you this Easter, that you'll receive that gift. We'll close with the mission statement. Because the resurrection of Jesus proves he defeated sin and death on our behalf, we fulfill our mission of sharing the gospel with others, telling how we have come to know and love Jesus. And thank you for joining us. Happy Easter.